Turn, turn with me to Romans chapter 10 today. A priest was walking down the street one day when he noticed a very small boy trying to press a doorbell on a house across the street. However, the boy was very small and the doorbell was too high for him to reach. After watching the boy's efforts for some time, the priest moved across the street and walked up behind the little fella, placing his hands kindly on the child's shoulder. He leaned over and gave the doorbell a solid ring. Crouching down to the child's level, the priest smiled benevolently and asked, And now, what little man? To which the boy replied, Now we run. <laughs> How many did that when they were little kids? Confession is good for the soul. It's good to, to get that out. A teacher asked little Sammy to tell the class what his father did for a living. Oh, he's a magician. His best trick is sawing people in half. Wonderful, said the teacher. Are there any other children in your family? Yes, ma'am, I have two half-brothers. <laughs> Romans chapter 10. Isn't God amazing? I mean, you know, it seems like about the time I feel like I've been as, uh, as amazed as I could possibly be by God and the things he does, he just takes another step beyond what I could imagine. It, it's fun serving a living God. It's not fun being religious. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> But it's fun serving a, little, a living God. We're in the second part of a series on kingdom economics and supernatural provision. We've been looking at stories in the Bible where God supernaturally supplied and they're not hard to find. Supernatural provision, it, it, if you're just thinking money, you're, 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 you're looking at this on such a limited level. Supernatural provision happens in so many different ways. And what I'd like to do is just review for a few minutes some of the things that we talked about last week. Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The reason this is true is because the word of God reveals the will of God. And when I know what the will of God is, it gives me confidence to approach him in prayer. John, 1 John 5 says, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we know that we have the petitions that we've desired of him. Knowing God's will gives me confidence to approach him in prayer because I know I'm asking him to do something he wants to do. How many remembered as a little kid approaching your, your earthly dad and, and you, you know you're asking him to do something that he doesn't want to do and you, did, and you knew from the get-go there's not much chance of making this happen. <laughs> but, but if you know you're asking your dad something that he wants to do, if you know you're asking your heavenly father something that he's revealed through his word already that he wants to do, then we can have confidence. Now here's the interesting thing though. A person can have faith for a particular area concerning God's will, for example, salvation. Because they know what the word of God says concerning that. They know it's God's will. It's not God's will for anyone to perish. They know that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so they know what God's will is. It's possible to have confidence or faith in one area, but not have confidence or faith in another area. You know, we were, we were talking about peace today. <laughs> one, one of the most valuable things to me is the peace of God. Amen. I mean, I can have peace no matter what's going on. No matter what terrorist threats are happening or different things. I remember this, the, the, um, Chuck Pierce has a son and his son, you know, he was probably nine or ten years old. And when the, when the Twin Towers thing happened, and, and, and he just suddenly became filled with fear. He just became filled with fear. And his dad, his mom, they were trying to comfort him. They were trying to say, you know, you don't have to worry. God will protect you. God knows who you are. God, you're in his hands. 
And so he went out in the backyard, and he's in the backyard, and he just said, okay, God, if you're really willing to protect me, have a monarch butterfly land on my hand. And it did. And all of the fear left. Because God is so big. One of the things that I value so much as a Christian is peace. I can have peace. It doesn't matter what's going on around me. I can have peace. It's part of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. Isaiah 26, verse 3. There is peace. Jesus said, my peace I give to you. It's not, it's not a peace that the world can take away because it's a supernatural peace. I can have faith for salvation and not have faith for peace because I really don't know what God's will is concerning that because I really haven't looked at the word of God. Or I can have, have, I can have faith for peace but not have faith for healing because I've bought into some traditions of man and I haven't really discovered what the word of God says concerning that area. So what, what's the solution? The Finding out what God says. Finding out the truth as it's revealed in God's word. Hosea 4, 6, the beginning of that verse says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Now, please understand, it's not his will that this be. My people are destroyed. One translation says they perish for a lack of knowledge. They, they don't know what God's will is. Now, it's never been God's will for us to be ignorant of his will, and that's why he's given us this amazing book. A, a book that most of us have 27 copies of <laughs> in different translations and different ways, and yet, do we really understand the value of this book? 66 books, 44 different authors, over a course of 1,500 years, people from every walk of life, shepherds, kings, tax collectors. I mean, it, it just, all of these people through all of those years had an encounter with the same God and wrote to tell about it. And as a result, we have this amazing, amazing book that reveals to us the God who loves us, the God who created us for his plan and for his purpose, the God who wants to know us and wants us to know him. This is an amazing book. But, but what is God's will? Have you ever heard somebody say that? I wonder what God's will is. Well, you know, we can know from the word of God a lot of things that are God's will. I can learn from the word of God the, the, the how do I want to say this? I can learn from the, 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 the word of God the general will of God. I can learn from the Holy Spirit the specific will of God. I know it's God's will for me to serve God. The Bible tells me that. But I don't know, is it God's will for me to serve him in, in Walla Walla or in Seattle or in Hawaii? The Holy Spirit will tell me that. <laughs> You know, they, they warned you to, say, to never say never. And so I've been saying I'm never going to pastor a church in Hawaii. <laughs> I, I really say that jokingly because I, I, I know where I am and I know why I'm here. And I, I'm, not, I'm not planning on going anywhere. I would rather be here than any place on this planet. But, but here's the thing. People wandering around wondering what the will of God is. Who does God want to be to us anyway? See, some people have this, this religious idea of God that he's this, this impersonal being that, that just wants to give us rules and we walk through life in this restrictive religious lifestyle and yet that is so not the Bible. That is so not the God of the Bible. He is a God who wants to have a relationship with us and his spirit actually brings liberty, brings freedom to our lives and actually empowers us to do the things that he wants us to do. We were never called to be religious. Now, I'm using that term in a negative sense, and I realize there's a positive sense for that word. I'm not talking about that. We were never called to just be religious people. 
you know, you should come and I've got, I've got these really great rules. You should have them too. Do you know what I mean? You know, you, you need to be as worn out as I am <laughs> trying, trying to serve God. You need to, you know, that, that's not attractive. I don't want that. The, Jesus said, and you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. And, and, and who the Son of God sets free is free indeed. True freedom comes out of a relationship with God that comes through Jesus Christ. But, but I, I still want to ask that question. Who does God want to be to us? You know, the answer to that would be, well, what has he said? You know, what, what do we find in the promises? But, but do you know that apart from even the promises, his very names reveal who he desires to be to us? Jehovah to Sidkenu. This, this is in your notes. That means the Lord our righteousness. Do you know that God wants to be your righteousness? That you don't have to be your righteousness? At that point, you're supposed to say, thank God. You know, me on my best day trying to be religious, my righteousness is like filthy rags. But see, Jesus came and he died on the cross. He lived this perfect, sinless life. He, he died on the cross and he took my sins, he took your sins and the penalty for those, that sin and he gives us his righteousness and the reward of that righteousness. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God wants to be our righteousness. That's who he is. Jehovah Ra, the Lord our shepherd. God wants to be your shepherd. He wants you to be a sheep that hears his voice and follows him. And he will lead you beside still waters. He will take you into green pastures. He will restore your soul. I just felt wind. I just felt an emphasis on that. He will restore your soul. I'm speaking to certain people here today. He will restore your soul. He will make you whole. He wants to be our shepherd. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. You know, he wouldn't reveal himself as something that he didn't want to be. Does that make sense? Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. The one who is our source. The one who meets our needs. Jehovah Shalom. What does that mean? The Lord our peace. Th this is besides all of the promises in scripture to be those things to us. His very name, who he reveals himself to us as reveals who he desires to be in our lives. Does that make sense? Now, why is so much healing happening today? Compare it to 30 years ago. I saw people healed. I saw legs grow out back then. I saw things happen but it's nothing like today. How many have noticed that? There's this acceleration that's taking place. Why is that? Because we've been looking at what the Word of God says, we've been taught what the Word of God says, we have displaced the traditions of men in our life that have, would come to make void the Word of God, and we've replaced it with the truth of what God says. And, and we've started acting like it's true. <laughs> I just want to encourage you tomorrow just pretend the Bible's true <laughs> just try it it's amazing just act like everything he says in this word is true and live like it and see what we started doing is we started in the quiet place we are crying out to God we're saying God I want to know you I want to have a greater intimacy with you Lord if there's more of you I want it there is more of you I want it God We've been crying out for more in the secret place than we've been going out in the public place and taking chances, taking risks, inviting God to come, inviting his presence to come and transform and change people's lives. So what's going to happen as we start talking about what the Bible says about kingdom economics and supernatural provision? Don't you think it's going to stir our faith? Don't you think it's going to stir us to believe God for financial miracles? Don't you think that faith will come by hearing and hearing by the word of God? 
I just, you know, we, we are seeing such a season uh, of reaping on, on what we've sown into our hearts and into our lives concerning the area of healing. I mean, it's every day. Every day we see miracles. Every day we see pain leave. Every day we see backs healed. Every day we see those things happening. And it's not going to get any less. It's an accelerated thing. And see, God wants us to, to believe beyond that because it's no different than, than healing a back for God to release a financial miracle into our lives. And I, I just want to encourage us. I... I've never felt like I feel this year as far as a green light to go after these things. You know, as a church, I, 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 I'm going after the next building. I'm going after the next facility. It doesn't matter how much we have in the bank. God is our source. But it's by the same token, I want to encourage you to go after it personally too. I want to see mortgages paid off. I, I want to see God move in a way that, 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 you know, I love telling the stories about people being healed. I love, you know, if you want to just sit down with me, I probably could talk for three hours. Just different things I've seen within the last year. I love to talk about it. But I, I believe that God wants us to get excited and, and, and start to share the testimonies of what he's done in the financial area. Are you with me? Okay. I started talking about Kingdom Economics 101 or the basics last week because I believe it, it lays a foundation to expect God to do amazing things. So the beginning place is tithing. I believe that positions us to be blessed and to increase. I talked about it last week, didn't quite finish, so I wanted to finish that today and then, then keep going on. I want to look at one passage of scripture we looked at last week and then another passage of scripture that talks about it. Proverbs 3.9. I'm sorry. Yeah, 3.9. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. As we looked at it last week, we discovered that the first fruits is the tithe or 10% of our increase or income. As we give to God, we are honoring him and acknowledging him as our source. And there is a promise that goes with this. In verse 10 it says, So your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will overflow with new wine. Now, the very language of this promise is abundance. It's more than a promise for God to barely meet our needs. That's not the language. The language is filled and overflowing so that you have an abundance, so that you can be a greater blessing to others. God is able to make all grace abound toward us, that we always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. What does that mean? God is able to bring us to a place where we not only have a self-sufficiency, but we have more than that so that we can be a blessing in every single situation that we step into. It, it, it can never be unto ourselves. God blesses us to be a blessing. God blesses us to, to be a greater instrument to be used to bless others. Do you know that there's actually no greater sense of joy and fulfillment than blessing other people? You know, when Jesus said it's more blessed to give than it is to receive, he wasn't just saying something that he wished was true. He wasn't just saying something that kind of sounds good. He was saying, this is really true. You know, now I know when I've had a need and, and, and God has supernaturally provided for that need and, and, and I can tell you a lot of stories. I shared some of, some of them with you last week. But you know, when you're in need and you need $40 or you need a certain amount of money and God comes and there's the money, you're pretty blessed. But God says, well, yeah, you're blessed. But you know the one who was really blessed? the one that God used to stop misfortune in your life. The instrument that God used to release that blessing into your life, that's the person that's really blessed. Are you with me? Yes. I mean, it's really true. Now, in your notes, the biblical concept is that the tithe belongs to the Lord. He has laid claim on that part of our income. And when we acknowledge that by giving him what he says is his, God steps in and becomes our source, our provider. 
So what is the biblical basis for the tithe belonging to him? Leviticus 27, 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. You know, God taught the nation of Israel to actually worship God with their tithe. He said, the tithe is mine, it belongs to me, and when you honor God by giving him what he says belongs to him, he will honor you by fulfilling his word in your life. Now, am I talking fast? Okay, thank you. Just right? Okay, good. Sometimes I just get wound up. I think I'm... Sometimes I've... I've what was that? One, one, time, uh, one time Sandy Owens was here and, and she was prophesying at the end of service and, uh, and I talked with John afterwards and, and John said, you know, she can talk faster than I can hear. <laughs> like, I, I, like I need to get a tape and like slow that down the slow motion a little bit so I can actually hear everything she's saying. You know, I've heard people say that tithing was under the law. And, and, and anyone heard that? And we're not under the law. We're not subject to that. I just want to talk about that for a minute and say this. Don't let the enemy talk you into something that isn't true. Don't let the enemy put you in a place where God is not able to bless you the way he wants to bless you. Don't assume that, that if you do everything the way you've always done it, that everything's going to stay, the, that, that things are going to change. What do they say insanity is? Doing the same thing over and over again and, and expecting things to turn out different. There were these four guys that loved to hunt. Let me just see your hands. It doesn't say. <laughs> so they loved to go elk hunting, but, but they didn't want to go where normal hunters went. Like they would rent, a, they would charter a plane that would fly them into a special you know, place that they would go where nobody else is hunting and of course pick them up at the appointed time and, and so they, they would go into places that very few hunters made it to and they flew into this great place. They had gone to the same place last year. This year was an unusually good hunting season. They, they, they shot six elk. They, they had actually gotten six elk the year before but, but it took them the whole time they were there. This time they got the six elk within the first few days and so they just kind of goofed off and, and do, did stuff that guys do. I don't know what that is. Do you know, Dale? Okay. <laughs> I'll talk to you later about that. <laughs> Finally, the plane and pilot arrived and they were loading things. The pilot said, we cannot carry all six elk out of here. I know the weight capabilities of this airplane. We could probably carry four of the elk, but not the other two. They said, we are not leaving without all six of these elk. Last year, we chartered a plane just like this one. We loaded six elk on it last year. The pilot said, are you sure? They said, yes. So the pilot reluctantly loaded all six elk and took off. The plane went for a little ways and then crashed. No one was hurt, but one of the hunters said, where are we? I think we're lost. Another hunter said, no, I think this is right where we crashed last year. It's supposed to be funny. Tithing is under the law. In Genesis 14, before Moses and, and, and the law ever existed, Abraham... What did that have to do with tithing? I don't know. Same, same result. That's it. That's it, Rocky. Thank you. Would you explain things to him when he looks confused? Just... <laughs> tithing existed before the law. Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. Abraham... Uh, tithe, he, you know, he's the forefather father of our faith. In your notes, tithing existed before the law. It was incorporated into the law as the me, a means of blessing the nation of Israel. God taught them to do the things that would release his blessing into their lives. But it was not a product of the law. It was a principle that existed before the law. 
You know, sometimes people are uncomfortable when the preacher talks about money. And yet we saw last week as we were looking at this area that it's actually a means by which God measures where we are spiritually. I just want to read that. It's not in your note. No, it's Luke 16, 11. Therefore, if you, have been faith, if you have not been faithful with the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Faithfulness with the stewardship of money positions us to be entrusted with true riches. Sometimes people are uncomfortable when, when, when the, the pastor talks about tithing. Now, my problem is, I, I got a revelation of tithing long before I was a preacher. And, and it's like it was so real to me. It, was, it, was, it changed my life when I realized that I could actually trust God now for my finances. It didn't depend on me all of a sudden. I just thought this is the greatest news in the world. Everybody needs to know this. And so I, I've unapologetically taught about tithing, but, but sometimes people are uncomfortable. And what it means is there's an unsettled issue in your heart. Now it's kind of like, do you remember before you got saved? And your, your friends came to talk to you about Jesus? Do you remember what you wanted to do? You didn't, but you wanted to say, would you shut up? You want, and, yeah, and, you did say, well, now I didn't, I just got away from him, Rocky. I, I just got away as quick as I could, you know, to kind of like, because I was uncomfortable. I'd turn on the TV and Billy Graham would be preaching. You've never seen a guy change the channel so fast. In fact, sometimes I just turn the TV off because it was an unsettled issue. But once I got saved, and somebody would start talking about Jesus, it was like saying, sick him to a bulldog. I loved it. You want to talk about Jesus? I'm, because it, it was a settled issue. And, and when, when I turned on Billy Graham, instead of changing the channel, I found myself praying for the, for the crowds. I, I'm praying and saying, God, please let their hearts be open to the gospel, to the good news, because it was a settled issue in my heart. Does that make sense? Now, there, there are some powerful promises in Scripture in relation to honoring God with our tithes and offerings. When we honor God by obeying him in this area, he honors us by fulfilling his word in our lives. So I want to look at one promise, and then we're going to go on. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. Everybody doing okay? Would you really tell me if you weren't? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Verse 6, for I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? How shall we return to the Lord? What are you talking about anyway? And then he takes us right into the arena of the area that we're talking about this morning. Verse 8, will a man rob God? You know, when I first look at that, when I think of a robber or a thief, I think of somebody that sneaks in when the owner or the, the possessor of, of the items is unaware it's happening, and I'm thinking, no, you can't steal from God. You can't rob God. But what is he saying here? Yet you have robbed me. But he says, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. Why would God say they robbed him? Because he'd already said, the tithe is mine. It belongs to me. When you fail to give to God what belongs to him, you are robbing God. And he says, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. When we fail to obey God, we, we take ourselves out from under his protection and provision, and that's not a good place to be. It opens the door for the enemy to come into our lives. But he, he says, here's the solution that will actually cause the enemy to be rebuked. Aren't you glad there's a solution? I, I'm so glad that when God points out a problem that he gives us a means to, to adjust that. Verse 10, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. I will rebuke the enemy for you. You will no longer be in a place where he can mess with you. Bring your tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Where are we to take our tithe? To the place we are being fed. To the place we are receiving spiritual nourishment. Your local church is the storehouse. And here's the amazing thing. We are invited to 
test God in this area and to see if he will not open the windows of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there is not room enough to receive it. And he will rebuke the devourer. You know, this is God's promise to the tither, to the person that's obedient in honoring God. And, and I feel like I need to say this because many times in scripture, his promises are conditional. If you do this, I will do this. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will forgive them and I will heal their land. God says, if you do this, I will do this. If you will draw nigh to me, I will draw nigh to you. If you will return to me, I will return to you. If you bring your tithes into the storehouse, this is what I will do. So this promise is to the tither. Not, not to the person who would like to be a tither. Not to the person who would be a tither if he just had more money. Which isn't true. But to the person who honors God by obedience, this is what God desires to do. So let me just read it one more time. I will open the windows of heaven and pour out for you so much blessing that you will not have room enough to receive it and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. When we are obedient to God, when we've done our part, please listen to me. There's nothing wrong with believing God to fulfill his part. There's nothing wrong with believing God to do what he said he's going to do. Now, I say that because of this. I've heard people say, well, you know, you ought to just give to God and expect nothing in return. Because that's true humility. I, 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 I beg to differ. I strongly disagree with that. You know, if a farmer went out and, and, and plowed his field and sowed, feeds in his, sowed seeds in his field and then waited a little while and said, you know, I really ought not to expect a crop. So a few weeks later, he goes and plows it all under again. That's not humble, farmer. That's stupid. <laughs> I'm sorry. I almost, I, I almost got in the flesh there. But do you understand what I'm saying? It's not wrong to believe God. Why, why, how could it possibly be wrong to believe God? The whole Hebrews chapter 11, the, the faith hall of fame, was all about people who believed the promise of God. In fact, it says without faith, it is impossible to please him. So that tells me it's never wrong to believe God. In fact, it might be wrong. Well, it is wrong not to. Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> I shouldn't have said stupid. <laughs> but that's not humility. True humility bows before God and bows before the authority of his word and believes it. True humility positions ourselves for God, God's word to be fulfilled. Mary was functioning in, humi in humility when, he, when she said, Behold, the handmaiden of the Lord, be it unto me according to your word. That's humility. Lord, I can't do this. I don't even understand how it can happen, but your word says so, so I believe it. You ever been in that place? Lord, I know, I know your word promises this, but man, I don't know how you're going to possibly do that, but I just bow. I just bow before the authority of your promise, before the authority of your word. <clears throat> now, we've very purposely, you know, already taken the offering because I, I never want a person to give out of emotions because you were moved by, by a message. This is so much bigger than that. This is an issue that needs to be settled in our heart. All kingdom issues are heart issues. Now, that's it. That's Kingdom Economics 101. Let's go on to supernatural provision. Let's go on to where our faith can take us and, and let's see God doing supernatural things that, it, that is, is not just healing, that is not just in that dimension. So 1 Kings chapter 17. I have time. Thank you. Oh, can you believe it? My computer is doing that again. Can, 
Configuring Windows updates, 30% complete. Do not turn off your, your computer. <clears throat> First Kings, fortunately I have a Bible. <laughs> First Kings chapter 17. Now let me give us a little bit of a backdrop here. Because in this passage of scripture, Ahab is the king of Israel. Thirty-five percent. Now, Ahab, it said he 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 did more evil than all the kings that were before him. It says he provoked the Lord more than all who were before him. And because of that, there was a judgment that was coming on the nation. He'd married Jezebel. They were starting to serve Baal. They were building places of sacrifice to Baal. I mean, it was not a, a, a good picture. Let me type in my password. Were you able to figure out what it was? Just by my positioning. And so it says, And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Now, now can you imagine that? It's not, not only is it not going to rain, but there's not even going to be any moisture on the ground. You know, I, I don't think we really have any idea what that would be like. We live in a culture that, that doesn't really suffer from drought. In other words, we, we get water, water pumped right to our house. We, mo, mo, a lot of farmers, they're not reliant upon the rain because they've got irrigation systems that water their crops. But in this day, if the, if the heavens didn't rain, the crops died. In this day, when there was a drought, man, it affected everything. Okay. Then the word of the Lord... Now, I don't know that Ahab took him that seriously until it really started happening. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Elijah, saying, get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And it shall be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So God tucked this prophet away he knew that Ahab was going to get ticked. He knew that Ahab was going to hunt him down. So he tucked this prophet away in hiding. And he said, go, go by this stream of water that goes into the Jordan. And I'm going to have the birds feed you. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I call that supernatural provision. Most ravens don't do that. <laughs> What's that? Oh, yeah. It totally is. In your notes... Now, here, here's the thing you need to know. That when judgment comes, God is going to take care of his own. Yeah. Amen. He just will. In your notes, God will always take care of his people and he'll do it supernaturally if he needs to. When, when God judged Egypt, you, you see the protective hand upon the Israelites in, in Goshen. Now, verse 5. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows from the Jordan. The, brave, the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Isn't that amazing? I've never had a bird bring me food, I've had him do other things. This is amazing. These stories are recorded as a testimony of God's goodness and provision. These stories are recorded for us to read and say, if God did it then, he can do it now. They are written to stir up our faith to believe. Verse 7, and it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. So God's going to have to do something else, and, and God has a plan. He always does. Nothing ever takes him by surprise. He will never forget about you. Trust, trust in him. Now in verse 8, we have the story of Elijah and the widow. How many know this story? Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I've commanded a widow there to provide for you. <laughs> What's interesting about this is the widow doesn't know that yet. I love the way God talks, like it's a done deal. I've commanded somebody to take care of you. <laughs> but the truth is, in her obedience, she's going to be provided for too. 
Verse 10, so he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks, and he called her and said, bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink, which she's perfectly willing to do. But as she's going, verse 11, and as she was going to get it, he called her and said, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. The audacity of this prophet. He's speaking to a widow lady during the dr a drought. Can you imagine? Well, he's actually one that's just operating in obedience to what God told him to do. Verse 12, so she said, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread. Only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. How many of you know she doesn't have a great vision for the future? You know, I, I've often referred to sometimes people can get into what I call a survival vision or survival mentality. They're going from fire to fire, from difficulty to difficulty. They're just trying to survive. She doesn't even have that. She's going to eat worms and die. You know, thank God that he doesn't leave us in those places. Thank God that he comes to break those things off of our lives and bring us into the good things that he has for us. Verse 13, and Elijah said to her, do not fear. It is a good word, isn't it? Most people are afraid in the season of drought. Most people are afraid when the economy starts tottering or, or something like that. But he says, don't be afraid. Do not fear. Go and do as, I, as, as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first. And bring it to me, and afterward, make some for yourself and your son. Do not fear. Do not, don't be afraid of what the future holds. You are in God's hands. Make me a small cake first and bring it to me. That was her part. That's what she needed to do to be obedient to God. But now God's part, the promise. Verse 14. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. As, as this widow honored God by honoring the prophet that God had sent to her, by, by being obedient to the instruction that God had given to her through Elijah, it released something supernatural in her oil, in her flour. It did not run out. Now that's amazing. But it's really a simple, simple thing for God. It's a simple, simple thing for God. Do you want to live out of the natural or the supernatural? Do you, do you want to, your confidence to be in the flesh or in the living God? There's a scripture in Jeremiah chapter 17. It's not in your notes. And, and I, I just want to highlight it here because it, 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 it's what we're talking about. Jeremiah chapter 17. I'm, I'm reading in verse 5. I hope it's here. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. Man, as far as people, I don't want to be that guy. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh, my ability to produce, my ability to connive, my ability to work this situation. But then he says this, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, drought nor will cease from yielding fruit. In other words, when, when the drought comes, he's not afraid because he's trusting in God. His root system actually goes clear into another realm. And that tree, that, 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 that righteous tree is drawing life from a supernatural realm because the, his trust is in the Lord. And even in the year of drought, his leaves don't wither. 
because of they're tapped into another realm. He, 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 he never ceases from yielding fruit because his trust, his hope is the Lord. That's where, that's where I want to be. I, I don't want to trust in my ability to produce. I don't even do well balancing a checkbook. That's why my wife does that. <laughs> do you want to live out of the kingdom of God? Jesus did. Do you know that no matter what situation Jesus found himself in, he was never afraid. He was never anxious. You know, these, these hundreds of people here haven't had anything to eat for a long time and it's been three days, you know, you, you feed them. And they, the disciples said, well, we, we don't have, all we've got is a boy's lunch. And Jesus said, no problem. The message, I'm sure. It's not a problem. Give me what you have. Watch God do something. He was never stifled by the limitations of this natural realm. He was never limited by the limitations of this natural realm because his roots went into another realm. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now I know sometimes when we think of the kingdom, we're, we're, we're thinking of heaven. We're thinking of, oh, I can't wait till I die. But, but, but the kingdom is coming now. In fact, you've entered into the kingdom. When you were born again, when you came alive, you stepped into the kingdom of God. And you can live and operate and function from that kingdom. God is not a withholder of anything. Verse 15. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry according to the word of the Lord which he spoke to Elijah. You know, when you have an experience like that, your vision changes. She was no longer, I think I'll eat worms and die. She'd seen the supernatural provision of God. It, it breaks things off of you. When you experience that, there's nothing to fear. I, I know that the circumstances we're in tend to get magnified. You know, we, we look at this or we look at that and it gets magnified in our perspective. And, and sometimes it's like we got this big circumstance and a little God. But, but get your eyes in the right place. Magnify the Lord with me. Get your focus on him and let things come into perspective. You know, David went out against Goliath. That was absolutely ridiculous in the natural. We're talking a, a great big buff guy like Tony. We're talking about a guy that, this guy does insanity every day. This guy, you may not realize it, but he's buff. And we're talking, but, but, but like huge, like how tall was he? Anybody know? Yeah, about nine feet tall. Now, can you imagine, like when, when I stand up to somebody, now I'm a tall person. But when I stand up to somebody that's, that's six foot six, they just seem huge to me. Can you imagine what a nine foot person would look like? A little bit intimidating. A, a warrior from his youth, yet David was not trusting in his ability to fling the sling. He was trusting in the Lord. <laughs> The God who caused this miracle to take place that we just read about is alive and well today. And he's a God who lo longs to manifest his kingdom, to manifest his provision in the earth. He's still doing supernatural things. He's still multiplying food. He, he's still doing the miracles that we read about. You know, I still marvel at, at, at the Christmas gathering we had. You know, John and Diane Briggs you said, you know, let's, let's do something special for Christmas. Let's gather the families. Let's gather the, the local house together and, and let, let's, let's do something special for Christmas. So they called everybody Everybody in the directory, everybody, and, and they were expecting 70 people to come. And you know, when 70 people commit to come, 70 people usually don't come. So they're actually figuring for 60 people. So they, it wasn't a potluck. Everybody came hungry without food, and there was enough food here. They were figuring for 60 people, and 137 people showed up. Man, we were, we were running around setting up tables up here. We were, you know, uh, I mean, it was crazy. And in reality, it sh the food thing shouldn't have worked. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
It shouldn't have worked. But everybody ate. Everybody had a good time. No one left hungry. It was supernatural. God is still doing that stuff. Let's stand together. I, I just want to encourage you that there, there was a time when, when I stood before congregations of people and said, you know, God is still in the healing business. We all know of people that have been healed. I know we don't see it very often. I know, it, you know, it's, it doesn't happen at the level we'd like it to happen. But, 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 you know, let's contend. Let's believe God. Let's look at what the scripture says. Let's find out what God, God's will is and let's go after it. That's what I'm saying about this area today. We've seen the miracles. We've seen the healings. We've seen those. And I want it to just get more and more. I'm not going to lay off that area a bit. I believe it's part of God's evangelistic program. Healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons, cleansing the lepers. But I just believe God wants to do some things that will surprise you. In fact, I, I believe what he wants to do is he wants to, be, to begin to prepare your mind to embrace the reality of that. Sometimes our minds, not sometimes, all the times, our minds need to be transformed by the word of God. There needs, needs to be a renewal, the washing of water by the word. We have these limitations that we place on God. We have these concepts that, that, have, that have happened as a result of things that we've walked through or things that we believed that were not accurate. And God is coming with his word to wash those out and embrace a new mindset that does not limit the kingdom of God and allows him to be God. Does that make sense? And so I, I really believe... For us as a church, we are here by divine appointment. We are talking about the things we're talking about because God is about to do something. And, and just as many miracles as we hear every week of, of God healing people, we're going to start hearing miracles of financial provision. It's, it's the same faith that releases it, that releases healing. It's the same faith. So thank you, Lord. <laughs> I, I just want to take a minute this morning. I just feel like the Lord is here. The Lord has been doing things in people's hearts. And, and I, I guess this, this is what I feel like God is saying. I, I, I want to call my children back to me. Those that maybe have known me but, but have kind of wandered away a little bit have kind of let the things of the world, the things kind of pull at them. God is saying, I, I, want, I want you. I paid a price for you. I, I want all of you. And you were created for this. You, you were designed for this. You will never be happy. You will never find fulfillment apart from me. And, and I, just, I just believe that there are some people here today that, that God is calling you back into an intimacy, back to your first love, back to the place of, of the joy that you once had. Let, let's just bow our heads before him this morning. Father, we just thank you for your presence. We thank you that you are a God that woos us. You, you whisper sweet somethings into our ears as you, as you draw us to you. So Father, I just, Holy Spirit, just come and fill this place. If you're here this morning and, and, and you've, 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 you've wandered away and, and, you're, and you're saying, God, I want to come back. I want to know you. Would you just raise your hand? Would you just acknowledge that today? Thank you, Jesus. Father, I just pray for everyone that, that's lifted their hand, that has is, that is acknowledged that. Holy Spirit, just come and, and touch them afresh. Just breathe on them afresh, Lord. As they draw near to you, Lord, you're, you're going to draw near to them and they're going to experience a refreshing and a renewing in their hearts and in their lives. Thank you, Lord. J just pray this prayer with me. Father, I want to know you intimately. I am your child. You created me for your plan, for your purpose. Help me to step into it, Lord. Forgive my sins. Renew me. Refresh me. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to invite the prayer teams to come and be available to pray with people today. The benediction I, I want to share with you is, is out of Deuteronomy 111. But, but let me just mention this. Uh, the meetings start next weekend, Friday night at 7, Saturday morning, 9 a.m., Saturday afternoon at 2 p.m., and then our, our Sunday morning meeting at 10. This will be a great time to invite your friends, to invite your family, to invite anybody you know that is hungry for more of God. I, I, I can't describe the expectation that I have in my heart about what God's going to do and what he wants to do. Deuteronomy 111, may the Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times more numerous than you are and bless you as he has promised you. God bless you, saints. Have a wonderful, fruitful week.